This video is brought to you by Manscaped.com. In the first part of this series, I pointed out some issues I had with the material from pacing to some short instances where it felt like it lacked a focused direction. That was before it unequivocally won me over through the level of care and passion Kishimoto clearly demonstrated for the character of Naruto and the wider world he inhabits. From that point on, I knew this story had something to it, something I didn't expect to see. And going into this second arc, I was optimistic, but concerned that it wouldn't live up to the climax of the previous installment. That I had seen the very best Kishimoto had to offer, and that now, it would either be more of the same, or experience a slight decline. Little did I know, I was about to read an arc that would exceed any and every expectation I've had for this series. So far, Naruto seems to be full of surprises. <laughs> This arc was phenomenal, taking the vast majority of criticisms from my first video and turning them on their heads to make one of the most competently well-written arcs I've digested in a long time. Funny, thrilling, philosophical, and stunningly depicted, the Chudin exams are a monument to what Kishimoto can do, and I can't wait to discuss what I thought worked so damn well and one or two areas where I was a little unsure. Right from the get-go of this arc, it wastes no time at all establishing what the goals of our main trio will be and what the goal of the arc is. Where I felt the first act's prologue was weighed down by its establishing of these characters causing it to feel a little rough around the edges, this arc by comparison is a finely polished gem, utilizing all the pre-existing relationships we're familiar with to bolster the motivations of the characters in this story being told here. Naruto still wants to prove himself and to become the next Hokage, and now he has the chance to achieve the level of journeyman ninja, the same level as Iruka, his only father figure, and one that throughout this arc makes it clear that he believes that Naruto and Ko are not ready and confronts Kakashi about this directly. It's cute and it adds more drama going into the exams for us and makes us ask the question, what will these exams be like? Sasuke's motivation is in comparison a lot more simple, or at least it is early on. He's sick of going on meaningless nothing missions that don't push his abilities. From the very beginning, his character has had one express motivation, to avenge his family. And this arc explores that facet of his character in much greater detail than the first did, as he expresses excitement over finally getting a chance to test his abilities against worthy adversaries. The results are some of the most shocking moments in this series so far. However, for me, the best part about these pre-exam build-ups has to be the indication we get of something meaningful finally happening to the character of Sakura. One of the biggest issues I personally found with her character was that, at least compared to the other characters, she didn't really have much depth. She felt less like a character and more like a useful mechanism in the story to create either tension between characters or to insert comedy. And while those attributes are important in a story, they don't make a great character in my mind. And so, the choice to give her plenty of characterization in the lead-up to the exams was exactly what I thought she needed. This feeling of being less than, being left out, and not having the belief in herself to press onward, to have the courage to fail. For me, this injection of doubt and conflict in her mind not only made sense given her company and what she has done or not done, but also because it gave her the chance to rally herself right before the application process ended. It helped me build a relationship with her as a character, which was exactly where I thought she was lacking. And now as this trio marches confidently into an exam many see as far above their current level, we begin this story and the characters we meet along the way are what make this as magical and intense a tale as it ultimately becomes. So, I guess it's time to start. The Chunin Preliminary Exams Within this story, there are three preliminary exams followed by the finals. Dozens and dozens of cell groups enter and only a handful of participants will make it past these prelims. I've seen many tournament or exam arcs in my day, but none like this. There's an element to this that really makes it stand out and I plan on addressing it as I go. So, let's start with the first test. Know it! People this to The written exam. As soon as I gathered that the focus of this arc would be an exam where students and future prospects would face each other in what I assumed at the time would be hand-to-hand -hand combat for the chances of promotion, I got extremely excited. I've made it clear in the past that some of my favorite storytelling devices or settings are these which follow a predetermined and easily understood format. Tournaments and exams all offer wonderful moments for characterization to lead the charge on top of offering numerous wonderful chances to get to know new characters. And given that Kishimoto was a massive fan of Akira Toriyama's Dragon Ball, I was wasn't surprised in the slightest that just like his idol, Kishimoto's second arc 2 featured a similar format focused on progressing to later rounds. However, what I wasn't anticipating was the creative approach he took. 
Numerous stories and series wrestle the laurels of the Examine Tournament format, relying on it to carry the majority of the creative weight while they focus on characterization. There's nothing wrong with this approach and many have used it effectively. Dragon Ball was one of the earliest adopters of this format and in being such was quite straightforward and by the books in its approach. However, when I saw that Kishimoto wrote the first part of this exam to be a written paper test, I was completely taken off guard. In fact, I think I laughed out loud when faced with the concept initially. The idea that he would attempt to make entertaining something as mundane and visually boring as writing felt not only like narrative suicide, but also grabbed my attention the same way a train wreck might. Different series have made writing compelling in the past like Death Note, but I couldn't see something like that working for a story like Naruto. A paper test just seemed like a bad idea, but I could not have been more wrong. Slowly, I started to understand not only was this going to work as an interesting section of the story, but it was, I think, a genius and unique utilization of this story's particular strengths. I'm specifically referring to its premise and themes. And once I caught on to the fact that they were being encouraged to cheat in order to pass, coupled with Naruto's innate inability to understand abstract concepts at the best of times, made not only for a compelling set of humorous and dramatic scenes, but present what I thought was one of the most brilliant challenges possible for a ninja-themed exam. I would never have thought of it, and something like this can only really work in a story like this about ninja training. It's so damn good! This exam's format follows in principle a very similar path to that of the old Tenkaichi Budokais from early Dragon Ball, wherein the preliminary matches before the main course set up the rivalries, establish the villains, and our other main characters that will participate later. While at this stage in the early 2000s that particular format was somewhat tired and done, this innovation on those principles in this new setting offered all the same benefits in a new way I've never experienced. In the last video, I never understood the love some people had for the character of Sakura, but with the introduction of these written exams, my opinion on her completely changed. In addition to helping establish new characters like Gara, Hinata, and Lee, it also made me do a 180 on the character of Sakura with her intelligence on full display, proving to us that she's more intelligent than even Sasuke, carving out her own little niche in the group, ending on a thunderously powerful philosophical note where the examiner does the unthinkable. He presents the class with a dilemma. Either take question 10, get it wrong and fail, or bail now and try again next year. Apart from this once again taking me off guard with its immediate high stakes, the philosophy that came from it not only once again felt appropriate for the themes and setting of this world, but again highlighted all the strengths of the Naruto character himself. The character that looked the worst during this written portion ended it with the most promise by proving himself in a different way. And so, taking a step back to appreciate everything this section achieved, these prelims both right before and after successfully highlighted the main antagonists, established the strengths and weaknesses of the main characters, and got me so damn excited for what was to come. I've read every Dragon Ball tournament, the Hunter exams of Hunter x Hunter, and the opening arcs of My Hero Academia, but none came even remotely close to the level of efficiency and creativity these chapters impressed me with. Major kudos to Kishimoto for this section. It's no small feat to tick all the boxes the way he's done here. Comfortably, it is my favorite part of the story, so far. The Forest of Death. The concept surrounding this section was interesting to say the least. While less focused in the prior and slightly more conventional, the opportunities this Hunger Games-esque type format offered should be clear. There's a reason TV shows like Alice in Borderlands and Squid Games have become so popular in recent years. Placing contestants into a battle royale type setting, buying for their lives has limitless possibilities for drama, comedy, and conflict all within creative and seldom seen set pieces. And this challenge was no different. However, funnily enough, this was a challenge that really helped me come to grips with some of the more intense themes of the story. And at first, I didn't completely understand. In the prior exam, Ibiki, the lead examiner for the written test, said before that test that, and I quote, from this point, there will be no more fighting without the express permission of the examining officer. And even if that permission is granted, anything that endangers another applicant's life is strictly forbidden. It seemed straightforward enough, I thought, no killing each other. And as the remaining kids signed the document waiving this rule of no killing, my mind's immediate first thought was that this must be a bluff on behalf of the examiners to create a high stakes simulation for their future young talents. I thought, okay, they each get one of two types of scroll and must retrieve the second type within the allotted time. I immediately thought an interesting concept would be that they all had the same color scroll and that those that managed to listen to the prior rules outlined by Ibiki would survive, while others would succumb to the pressure and take more drastic and drastic measures as time went on. Or something like that. There were countless directions for it to go and it ended up going in a direction I never saw coming. 
In an effort to try and outthink the story, I overthought the story, while it ended up delivering one of the most straightforward blows that shook me to my very core. I should put this on a shirt at this point for how frequently I say it, but placing characters under pressure is a great mechanism to help build a relationship between your characters and the audience reading or watching. Everything that transpires in moments of high stress and high stakes feels authentic. It can make a bad character feel more evil and a good character feel more righteous. And in these high pressure scenarios, Kishimoto reveals that the person attacking the group of Sakura, Naruto, and Sasuke is a murderer. It's a chilling revelation that suddenly changes the entire vibe of the exam. Someone by the name of Orochi Maru has stolen the face of an examinee, killing them in the process. Identity theft is not a joke, Jim. He's someone of tremendous danger and one far above the likes of Naruto and Sasuke in skill. Orochimaru is unlike any of the other characters I've encountered in this series. In the same way Zoro felt when he first tangled with Mihawk back on the Baradier, I felt like this encounter was equally as unexpected and demonstrated an enormous gap in ability between the characters. There's a tremendous amount of emphasis placed on Sasuke as he's the target of Orochimaru due to his lineage, but for me, the highlight of this section has to be Sakura. Once Orochimaru leaves his mark on Sasuke, reveals that he knows more than he's letting on concerning his past and places Sakura in a situation that actually made me feel so much sympathy for her, I was left a little stunned. Within a single chapter, Kishimoto flipped the script on this entire exam, downing both Naruto and Sasuke, thus placing a tremendous amount of pressure on Sakura. With no one to rely on, exhausted from lack of sleep and terrified of everything around her for fear of what might happen to Sasuke and Naruto, she stays by their side as vigilant as she can be. It's an incredibly endearing set of scenes that demonstrate her strengths brilliantly. When the cards were down and she needed to protect her friends, she, without hesitation, was willing to place her life on the line for them even when she knows that she's going to lose. <laughs> what begins as a brilliant sequence of scenes dedicated to the struggle and tenacity of Sakura builds up into a fight for survival, incorporating a host of different characters, revealing their backgrounds and motivations, for better or worse. Lee remains to be one of the best boys and most likable characters in this series, fighting with his heart on his sleeve, God bless him. And I can't help but admit that I see a little too much of myself in him at times. And while brief, his participation is one that stayed with me for the longest time during the Force of Death sequence, drawing distinct and obvious parallels to the character of Naruto in his admiration for Sakura and his determination to improve and save those that need him. Sasuke in this sequence appears more vulnerable than ever before. There's a terrifying collection of scenes where something horrific is awoken within Sasuke, feeding off his desire for revenge. Apart from looking very impressive both in the anime and the manga, this section impressed upon me something I hadn't considered before. Another contrast Sasuke provides Naruto specifically in this series. Where Naruto has had a demon sealed away inside him without his consent and chosen to fight against it to make it his own, Sasuke has been given one specific specifically because of his goals and actions. Naruto's goals fight to free him from his prison, and Sasuke's serve to become his undoing. Unlike Naruto, who wants to be the best he can be, Sasuke specifically is more and more over the course of this story becoming more and more consumed both figuratively and literally by his desire to kill his brother. And so, while this is just speculation, if he is to fulfill his role in the story to contrast Naruto, it stands to reason that the closer Naruto gets to realizing his goal, Sasuke will become more and more consumed by his. It's a remarkably interesting dynamic, and I can't wait to see how it plays out. Mr. Gara's characterization is terrifying, and in this scene, he single-handedly crushes my prediction that killing would be off-limits. What a messed up exam. Overall, taking into consideration the final segment of these Force of Death Hunger Scroll tag games, the vibe I'm left with is one of hope that leaves me with a chill in my spine. We met and came to know so many wonderful characters in these challenges, saw each and every one of the main trio experience hardship only to rise to the occasion and overcome. Some more so than others, and 
it helped to establish in a rather mysterious fashion the most intimidating villain of the series. Continuing the trend from the previous written exam, while this one was much longer, it wasn't in any way less creative or action-packed in my opinion. These tune-in exams thus far have been an absolute treat and have given me everything I love from the traditional shonen format. Action, comedy, heart and even tenderness through Iruka at the end as he welcomes his adoptive kid brother into his own leagues of journeyman ninjas. There's a palpable sense of love between these two characters and a wonderful sense of progression to boot. I loved this section and overall with this force of death sequence, what an adventure. As a quick aside, something I want to keep my eye on is the examiner Anko that encountered Orochimaru and got his sign on her neck. She seems to have gone through the same metamorphosis as Sasuke, so let's see how this progresses with her down the line. Manscaped is taking off. Their new out of this world experience with the performance package 4.0 is now available not just in the USA, but also now Canada, the UK, across Europe, Australia, South Africa, and even Singapore. Wherever you are, the right tools for your family jewels are now available. This package comes with a bunch of handy tools for your own package, and first scheduled for liftoff is the new Lawn Mower 4.0 trimmer. You've heard me talk about its skin safe blades and waterproof build quality, but did you know it also has a built in an LED spotlight to help you navigate the treacherous black hole of Uranus. And that's not all. The bundle now includes their Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Trimmer. This baby packs a whopping 9,000 RPM motor-powered 360 dual blade system, whatever that means, ready to rocket up the dark side of your hole for a pristine trim. You definitely can't forget the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Reviver either. Gotta help your little planet stay nice and fresh as you continue on your adventures. And those adventures can last a lifetime if you enroll in their Peak Hygiene Plan, replenishing your favorite products with direct delivery straight to your door. So if you're ready to abort hairy balls and Buzz Lightyear that woody with Manscaped, head over to manscaped.com and use coupon code NOTMARK20 to get 20% off, free shipping, and two free gifts. Your balls will thank you. サスケ、this changes everything I felt about the story of Naruto, and took what was I thought a more kid-friendly world and plunged it into a much more dark, screwed up, and politically driven universe. Which isn't a bad thing at all. If anything, this creates a nice contrast with the plucky and upbeat persona of Naruto himself. However, it does bring to my attention a few things worth mentioning. Having children hunt and kill each other is kinda screwed up. Even if, for the sake of argument, I were to remove my humanity from the equation and just look at this scenario through the eyes of a cold-blooded utilitarian, it's such a tremendous waste of future potential that could make something of themselves and serve their respective villages one day. I mean, I made the joke earlier about this force of death sequence being like the Hunger Games, but at least in that book series, people were selected for that, with only one person who volunteered to be the standout of the games themselves. There's a tragic nature to these events that paint Shinobi as tools of destruction, conflict and nothing more. Pawns for political gain. In my previous video I didn't touch on it very much but the relationship between Haku and Zabuza is very much in keeping with this notion. Haku viewed himself as a weapon to be used for the betterment of the only person who cared for him and Zabuza too felt that way as a ninja broadly speaking. It's tragic, it's horrific and to hear the Hokage of all people speak so frankly about what they are fighting for while interesting is really unsettling in a lot of ways. Effectively speaking confidently and candidly to the remaining successful and talented contestants about how disposable they are. In this world, events like the Force of Death, where they weed out the weaker ones, is normal, adding a much more sinister tone to the likes of Anko, who stated that she wanted to cut the numbers down by half, at least at the very beginning. And as we have that horrific taste in our mouths concerning the lack of humanity, it's time for the tournament to further whittle down their numbers. There are some significantly important matches and thrilling spectacles to be certain, but the majority of them weren't too interesting from a narrative point of view, so I'll only be sharing my thoughts concerning what caught my attention. Sasuke vs Yoroi while short, I thought this fight between Sasuke and Yoroi did everything it needed to with the little it was given. 
But what makes this section interesting isn't necessarily the fight itself, but the conversation that follows between Kakashi and Orochimaru. And just like the Hakage moments ago, his words, the arch villain of the series so far, echo his exact sentiments concerning Shinobi in a sense, that these people are expendable. And we're reminded of this towards the end of Yoroi's fight with Sasuke as he fights his curse, and once again in Shino vs Zaku, a scene so powerfully punctuated by Orochimaru's one-time lackey getting his arms literally destroyed from the inside out. It's horrific and made all the worse as we're given a fleeting glimpse into the world of this young man's history with Orochimaru seconds before. This story has gone from strength to strength when it comes to its implementation of themes and pacing, and while melancholic, this scene is no different. Sakura vs Ino I never spoke about Ino earlier in this video, despite her being directly involved in a number of scenarios, but Ino is another character that gets some decent shine and exposition here, and a chance to show her true colours. From a foundational perspective, I enjoy her popular girl demeanour and character design. But just like Sakura in the last arc, she suffers from issues stemming from Sasuke being a massive driving force in her life. However, and this is a big however, she does offer Sakura a means to further distance herself from this mindset. Again, I want to reiterate that really liking a boy or someone in a story isn't a sin or even a bad thing necessarily, but what's made me like Sakura all the more lately has been her ability to fight against her demons, and in the case of her defense of Sasuke, her insecurities, fighting tooth and nail to protect those she cared for, all the while earning the respect of those around her. This was a brilliant moment from the force of death and it's one of the reasons why I found this fight against Ino to be so incredibly frustrating. Not because it's bad, far from it, it's amazing. There's a touching story filled with impactful gestures, symbolism, and touching character writing. However, there's also this. Now look, I understand that in some cases, particularly for the purposes of deception and espionage, leaning into some more feminine qualities or embracing said qualities is important for young female ninja prospects to be able to wield. That makes sense as a concept, but Kishimoto I found whenever he tries to write a female character like a female character, he does so in a fashion that convinces me he's never seen or spoken to a woman ever in his life. There are some brilliant visual metaphors demonstrating Sakura's flowering personality and her independence like when she takes takes off her headband, emblematic of her taking off the security blanket her one-time friend Ino gave her. And that's brilliant, but throughout this chapter, instead of these two having a meaningful rivalry over something philosophically profound or substantial like the other fights, I'm constantly reminded that this is a rivalry over Sasuke's affection. However, looking past that, there's, as I said, so much to like about this fight. From its strategic action set pieces all the way to its terrific use of the way Kishimoto has depicted Sakura since the beginning, with her inner Sakura overriding Ino's control power. It's such a brilliant and creative idea. And really, while female character writing isn't his strong suit, creative implementation of these techniques certainly is, and I'm delighted this fight got some of that too. I'm a little bummed that it ended in a tie, but at the end of the day, it's still the best fight so far. And I think what I like about this section of the arc really is how much emphasis it places on the secondary and supporting characters. While Naruto does pick up the victory in his bout later on, there's not a tremendous amount that happens apart from ah. Hinata versus Neji. To be perfectly honest, of all the fights in this section, and trust me, there's a balls to the wall fight to end all fights in this section in a second, this fight first between Hinata and her cousin Neji totally took me off guard and turned out to be incredible. I had no idea the quiet girl and this person I didn't know the name of before would have one of the best fights of the tournament. There's a palpable resentment with heaps of political undertones broiling right beneath the surface as Neji expresses her resentment towards Hinata's family branch all the while Hinata tries to overcome her short comings and timid nature to give Neji a far more competitive bout than anyone ever expected from her. She's been one of the only classmates of Naruto to actually show him some admiration and respect when it's due, and I like how this fight has echoes of what made Naruto special because of that. She's able to recognize what makes him strong, and all throughout this arc, she's sort of been the only characters to believe in or care for him. And during this fight, the dominoes fall, and I come to realize why. She wants that sort of self-belief for herself. It's easily one of the best fights and Kishimoto does a terrific job of characterizing Hinata as someone of interest. Funnily and ironically enough, in writing Hinata, Kishimoto managed to write a more compelling female character than the likes of perhaps Sakura and certainly Ino. Gara vs Rock Lee. There it is! There it is! Oh my god! 
Before going into this fight, without knowing the source of these names, I had heard through the grapevine that Gata vs. Rock Lee was something special. I wasn't even 100% sure of which anime it came from, but whew, this be a good one. It was mentioned during the Force of Death exam that Gara's sand abilities happen without him needing to think, and this turns out to be the antithesis of Rock Lee, who had to work for every single thing he ever achieved. Unlike Gata, he wasn't born with this innate ability to perform sand manipulation as if he were a master of Ultra Instinct, but the initial back and forth between these two fighters plays to the advantages this setup provides too. Gata is set up to be this immovable object, this unbeatable foe, one that has never even had an attack land on him. And so early on, we not only see what Gata vs. Rock Lee is, but also the battling between two different approaches to work. Natural born talent and innate ability versus hard work for earned power. A tale as old as time certainly, and it's performed to tremendous effect here. A genius versus a genius of hard work. There's short glimpses we get to see into Lee's early life that paint a very similar picture to that of Naruto's upbringing. Surrounded by naysayers yelling at him to quit, reprimanding him for his failings and insulting him for his lack of natural ability. When his master guy walked up to him and called him a genius of hard work, I actually teared up a little bit. It's such a moving sentiment that really captures the essence of this character. Character. And in this fight, Rock Lee just goes full-blown fucking Kaioken. This is the coolest shit ever. I haven't spoken about this much as of yet, but the choreography and scope of this particular fight is unlike anything I've seen from this series to date. There are some absolutely breathtaking layouts, and the philosophical message brimming with hope, promise, and determination is enough to win my affections many, many times over. And all of this is turned up to 11 in the anime's adaptation. Thankfully, my team gave me specific episodes they deemed as must-watch episodes before I recorded these reviews to get my full experience, and Gara vs. Rock Lee is remarkable well produced in the anime, particularly for the early 2000s with its use of CG backgrounds. If you happen to have seen my Attack on Titan video, AJ wrote some cool sections about one of the earliest usages of 3D backgrounds in conjunction with 2D animation to pull off some insane sequences that inspired the iconic action seen in that show. And it was this particular episode that kicked things off. Directed by Toshiyuki Tsuru, who I've been told is a legendary name in this franchise, this episode switches things up by swapping to 3D backgrounds, which, although haven't aged well in places, did allow for some spectacularly ambitious sequences from the likes of iconic animator Norio Matsumoto. It's all so dynamic and the fact that this was possible on a TV schedule back in the early 2000s is astonishing. Turns out that it was Matsumoto who also animated the amazing sequences in the Force of Death episode I was told to watch and that was insane. I've been absolutely loving the choreography in the manga so to see these legendary staff members elevate even further the material was really cool. AJ's got me set up with all the animation highlights for the future so I'm definitely excited to see more here. For now, back to the manga. As wonderful as Gara is a dancing partner in this instance to bring out the best of Lee, it's Lee's mentor Guy that ends up carrying the bulk of this bout's emotional weight along with his lovable, precious protege. You can see in his eyes that what Lee represents and is fighting for matters greatly to him. That he not only can look on and enjoy the show, but is very much inspired by this young kid too. It's an outstandingly brilliant fight, easily the best I've seen so far in the series, and Kishimoto managed to achieve this level of personal, emotional, emotional involvement from me without using any of his main characters. Utterly spectacular stuff. This section of the story is largely set up with it primarily providing us with the chance to catch up with the plot lines concerning Orochimaru's plan to steal away Sasuke, the history of the fourth Hokage, and the various finalists preparing in their own ways for their respective upcoming final bouts in the tune-in exams. This is all fun and enjoyable, but it's rather standard. However, while reading through this section, I did find something worth perhaps remarking upon. A large portion of this waiting phase is spent following Naruto's preparation to fight in these final matches. In the he trains with a flamboyant mentor called Jiraiya who can summon a giant frog. It's humorous at times despite the fan service, however what's interesting about this is what it made me notice. I've mentioned this before but Akira Toriyama's Dr. Slump and Dragon Ball were massive influences on Kishimoto and Naruto by extension. And nowhere was this more obvious to me than with this specific scene. Ah! 
Years back, I wrote a series of videos wherein I attempted to break down how I understood certain characters in the Dragon Ball series worked. What made the likes of Vegeta, Piccolo, Frieza, and many others tick in a sense. And in them, I pointed out that one of the most simple and effective narrative mechanics Toriyama implemented was through the character of Son Gohan, highlighted perfectly in this scene. We're all familiar with Gohan's hidden reserves of strength only brought forth through danger, and it looks as though in his admiration of Dragon Ball he created in Naruto a character with the determination of Goku but with the mechanics of Son Gohan. Couple that with his color scheme, Toad Hermit Mentor, and it's not hard to see the similarities with that of Akira Toriyama's early material. But where this scene and Naruto himself deviates as a character comes moments after he's thrown. In the case of Gohan, his inner power was ill-defined and left to occupy our minds as pure speculation. It never came from anywhere other than him. Ironically, he has more of a claim to a chosen one type power than Naruto does in this way. In Naruto's case, Kishimoto decided to depict a scene inside Naruto's mind, where he confronts his literal inner demon directly. I thought this was a really cool idea and one I didn't think would happen. It's brief, but even so, it's full of character. Naruto doing what he does best when he's caught off guard. Act tough, resulting in the intimidating beast trapped within to acquiesce and lend Naruto the necessary chakra to save his own and by extension the fox spirit's life. It's definitely one of the most interesting developments for the Naruto character thus far and I was extremely excited to see where this one went. <laughs> I thought the purpose of this scene was brilliant. Isolating what makes Gara tick as a person, and just like I pointed out with the likes of Haku in the first arc, Naruto seems to have a great emotional maturity for these particular kinds of lost toy characters. Empathizing with their situation, even in the case of Gara, where he's saying some of the most reprehensible stuff, mirroring the main character, offering an example of him in an alternate world through the likes of a more unfortunate character that didn't have positive figures in his life like Naruto did, really serves to highlight what makes him wonderful. I mentioned that Naruto is a character that's designed to sort of look better when he's punching up, fighting on the back foot like Gohan was. Effectively, whenever an opportunity presents itself to show courage. And this is a character that due to Naruto's intimate understanding of what makes him tick, knows the lengths of how far he's willing to go. Naruto's been a character that shows a brash bravado in practically every encounter he's participated in, even up against the nine-tailed fox spirit. The reason he feels comfortable in doing so is for a myriad of reasons, but one particularly stands out in this case. More often than not, he knows he's willing to push himself farther than anyone because he needs to, but now he's met someone that's just as willing to do that and suddenly Naruto starts to shake. Brilliant scene. Similar to Sasuke in this sense, this is a villain that's tailor-made to make Naruto look amazing. Placing him on a back foot we don't often see him perform on, and I can't wait to see this fight now. Tune in final exams. I'm going to be glancing over some of these fights in the same way the manga did. While there were story reasons for one of them being entirely skipped over narratively, I really did feel like all the emphasis was on these two fights between Naruto and Nenji and Sasuke and Gaara. Both were amazing for very different reasons and I will be chatting about them in detail, but one fight I won't be covering that much of will be Shikamaru's. He'll say it himself, it's not what anyone came to see, but with that said, he had a decent showing for a chapter or two with some fun and creative action sequences. I really liked his shadow speciality and its implementation in this fight specifically. It's super fun and he's super smart. You're so smart I'm gonna throw up, hold on. <laughs> Naruto versus Neji. The climax of this fight shows firsthand to Neji, someone that believes someone's fate is determined at birth, that you can change your fate. All of Naruto's life, he was told that he would be nothing special. That even if he did have potential, he was a cursed child burdened with a fox spirit. And right now, in this fight, Naruto uses this as a strength. I loved watching this fight, and honestly, it might be the best Naruto fight thus far that I've seen. Kishimoto has done a terrific job of providing this young kid with a host of interesting adversaries to 
fight and bring out the very best in him. I've mentioned already why Gara is a powerful foil to Naruto as he shares a similar background but went a different direction in his life. But Neji on the other hand, instead of having a similar upbringing, channels a philosophy that runs counter to Naruto's. Obsessed with and convinced that everyone's fate is predetermined, that they are all hamsters running on wheels against a tide that none of them could possibly overcome or overturn. The exact opposite of Naruto's mindset. And showing this orphan child channel everything in his power to grab the victory was powerfully cathartic, with him effectively using all of his weak points and insecurities as strengths against his opponent. And by the way, when Naruto erupts from the floor with that massive uppercut to take out the pompous Neji, I actually punched my fist to the sky and shouted, YES! It's a brilliant fight, and for the first time, this one time loner receives the adulation of his peers. Once mocked for who he was, the determination he's shown in the face of adversity has delivered him the stage that he deserves. A victor's welcome. The message of this fight being, believing in possibilities can give you the power to change your destiny. What an empowering and uplifting philosophy. Sasuke vs. Gara. Something I've noticed in this manga, particularly this week after I had to read like nine volumes of them, is that there aren't really that many full page spreads. Kishimoto's paneling doesn't feel cluttered, but he doesn't often go all out with a full page spread too often. And that can be a strength, as seen in this fight here. He really goes out to make this feel like the spectacle it deserves to be. Ever since the one month training began, Sasuke has had a question mark hanging over his head. After what he went through in the forest of death and the qualifiers immediately thereafter, when he eventually shows up for this final showdown with Gara. we learn that he's been training with Kakashi, and the way the two of them are revealed on the page has a terrific sense of occasion thanks to Kishimoto's framing. The fight in addition to that gets a tremendous amount of shine too, and for all intents and purposes, this is Sasuke's highlight reel, with the very creepiest from Gara making itself known to us as he slowly starts to lose his mind. I don't think it's an understatement to say that this is an incredibly important fight, and just as Sasuke whips out what looks like to be his big finishing move, the arc takes a turn for the worst. This arc has been utterly spectacular and has shown me tons of stuff both to analyze and keep in mind moving forward. There's a massive political upswing in this upcoming material, I feel, and a war most likely. It's going to be amazing, and if you don't want to miss my first impressions and review of that material, don't forget to subscribe. But until then, I've been Totally Not Mark, I'll see you all next week, and thank you so much for watching.